Welcome back to the Fostering Financial Victories podcast. Appreciate you joining us again today. I am uh, joined today by Sarah Mansbach and McCrite King. So we're going to talk about an exciting topic. So insurance, um, right? Don't don't hit stop yet, right? You might want to listen to this one. So Sarah is the insurance guru on our team. Um, McCrite has a extensive background in the insurance world prior to joining our team. So I thought you guys would be great to uh, talk about this exciting topic. Where do y'all want to start? Well, we'll see if we're uh, if it's exciting and if we're the right people. Um, <laughs> fire away, Eric. I mean, yeah, I know we have a lot of good questions that we put yeah. together for this, so um, you know, we'll just we'll let you let you get us kicked off with some some nope. tough questions. No pressure. Okay, so insurance. It is probably one of the most misunderstood topics that we deal with daily. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. What's the first thing that you think of when the word insurance gets thrown around? Very first thing. Money. Money? Yeah. Uh, expensive. Expensive. Mm -hmm. All right. Protection. Protection. Those are all good. So some of the most common insurance topics, I mean, there are countless different types of insurance that's out there, right? You got, you, I mean, you can put insurance on your dog, <laughs> right? You can put insurance on your phone, your car, your house, mm -hmm. your kids, you name it, right? So. Right. What are the, some of the most common topics that we end up going through in our office would be life insurance, disability insurance, what, long-term care, probably some home and auto discussions. We don't get into the dog insurance too much, so that's good. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it, it's you know, ma mainly our focus as it pertains to the types of insurance is, is really the, the life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, the things that are uh, mainly centered around somebody's overall financial plan. Yeah. Um, you know, and normally these aren't the things that people want to spend a lot of time talking about. Um, but really when we boil it down and we think of everything overall in terms of somebody's plan and the things that are important, those are foundational elements that a lot of times we need to address and we need to make, to, to make sure that we have, uh, something in place typically, um, with, with those types of coverages. Yeah. So there's, I did some research on this earlier. So they are, uh, in 2018, there were approximately 1.2 million people who were licensed to sell insurance. Wow. Right, so the old adage is insurance is always, what, sold, never bought? Right. So that right. kind of goes into that. There's a lot of people out there selling all different types of insurance. So that's not just life insurance. That was kind of across the board. I thought that was a pretty astounding number. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when it when you kind of look at the landscape of how many different types of things that you could insure, it, I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's you know th roughly 330 million people in this country, right? So there's a there's a lot of a lot of people that need to be served, and you know we we're a lot of times by law or by the company that, uh, you know, we have our mortgage through, we're, we're, you know, required to buy insurance on our house, um, health insurance to a certain degree. Those are the things that are kind of like no brainers. Your car. Um, yeah, your, your car insurance, right? You gotta, gotta be legal on the road. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of different types of insurance, life insurance, disability insurance. I mean, that's just a, that's, that's another part of our lives that in, in, in most cases it's going to make sense to insure at some capacity. So why do, why do people um, avoid talking about life insurance when there are all these things that you have to do? I think a lot of people, it's a, they don't want to talk about mortality and they don't want to talk about that part of the planning. And it's also just another line item that, you know, is not fun. Yeah. It's kind of like the what if, worst case scenario, mm -hmm. am I really going to ever need it? Yeah, it's, su it's super difficult. Like as Sarah was saying, you know, it, it yes, it, there's there's a uh, component of it in terms of expense that a lot of times people just they're not really excited about paying those premiums. But as Sarah said, it really comes down to like, man, it's, it, that's just not the stuff that we wake up re up every day and want to think about. Sure, right, and that's where it's really like our job as planners, those people out there selling insurance. Right. I mean, it's to get people to think about the things that, unfortunately, they don't wake up thinking about every day. And when they do start to think about it, it's like, man, I'm going to put that off. There's definitely more exciting things uh, that I want to be doing with my time versus thinking about those those specific issues. So obviously, we can't talk about all the different types today. Um, I've, I've got two or three that I think most people would would find to be interesting. 
Interesting, maybe. Um, <laughs> right? Interesting as dying, talking about dying could be. So <laughs> right. let's get into some of the details about you know life insurance, maybe some of the, the misnomers, the myths, um, you know, the pros and cons of different types. Then we'll talk yeah. some of the like the disability and the long-term care piece, and we'll kind of finish up with that. Um, so with life insurance, there's a lot of different ways that you can buy life insurance. There's a lot of different kinds that you can do. Somebody who has no advising um, team in their corner, what? Where do they start? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So at, at, at the highest level, there's really two basic types of life insurance that somebody can purchase, right? So you've got term <laughs> life insurance and you've got permanent life insurance, right? So when I talk about term, uh, the name kind of gives a, gives a hint into what it is. It's going to insure you for a specific period of time. So most commonly, you're gonna see a duration of like 10, 15, 20 years, up to 30 years mm -hmm. that you can buy a level term policy. Now there's different types of term, but at its, at its core, you're buying it for a certain duration and you're gonna pay a premium uh, for that, that set number of years. And if something were to happen to you, if you were to unfortunately pass away during that time, it would pay a death benefit out. If you outlive that term, right, then it's not gonna pay off. So you're buying it to insure you for a specific number of years. So this could be while you're getting kids through college or where you, you, you have a lot of debt and you're still building your assets, but you're not in a place where you could self-insure, right? Permanent, on the other hand, is designed to cover you for your entire life. And there's several different types of permanent insurance that you can purchase as well. So at a high level, those are really the two main types of life insurance that you could go out there and purchase if you were in the market to do so. Right. So Sarah, you, you deal with a lot of the insurance carriers that we partner with to help our clients. Um, I do. Do you see a, uh, a difference or a, uh, maybe an overweighting to one side or the other with these types as, as you go through dealing with those folks? Do they, do they favor one over the other? Um, I think typically term is, is the more <clears throat> popular choice. Just generally it's more cost effective and it's more affordable. But um, if you were plan will allow and if your cash flow allows you know permanent life insurance is always a great um, benefit in terms of a retirement asset or a legacy play what about what we see from you know the the stigma so you mentioned permanent and term insurance well if you get on the google machine and start googling <laughs> permanent insurance you right. probably run into a whole bunch of negative connotations yeah. about it yeah not so much on term why do you think there's such a stigma between those two in the general society yeah, I, overall, there are, there are the opinions on life insurance in general, um, they're all across the spectrum, Eric. I mean, you know, the, you, you have some people that are like me, you should only buy term life insurance. Like really, really like passionate about yes, it. Yes, right. yes. I mean, you should only buy term life insurance, right? And, and that, that might be true a lot of times for a young couple who is in the, the early stages of their life. Maybe they own a new home, they have young kids, and they need a lot of life insurance protection. Without a doubt, term life insurance is gonna be the most efficient way for them to go buy the amount of protection that they need. And we can talk about like, what is the right amount later? Yeah. But that's gonna be the most cost effective way. You know, from our perspective, you know, we're looking at everything in continuity as far as their planning goes. So yeah, we're probably gonna have some term insurance. But depending on where they are in their financial life, they may be a little bit older. Their cash flow situation may be much different. It may be way healthier than somebody that's in their 20s or 30s, right? And their overall situation in terms of assets could be different. So that's where we start to look to say, does it make sense at some capacity to look at permanent insurance, right? So we, we really try to be balanced in that approach and not say this is the only fit or this is the only fit and saying, how does, it, how does it all come together with your plan and specific to your family needs and what you want? Yeah, I, I think that the legacy play that you mentioned uh, earlier, well, if, if that is a, a big concern, term insurance isn't really gonna give you the ability to do that, because, right. I mean, let's be honest, if a company's gonna insure you for, let's just say it's a million dollars of life insurance and they're gonna charge you $100 a month right. for 20 years, they can't be wrong very often, right? Right. I mean, well, and that's a great point, Eric, because like it's <clears throat> when you get to certain ages, the comp these companies are, are smart, right? I mean, they're 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 in it to make a profit. Let's, let's just call it what it is. They're not they're not, uh, not not profit it, companies. It, so. Exactly, exactly. So they're they're very smart. They have actuaries that price this stuff, and they do it based on the law of large numbers. So, so 
not to go off a rabbit trail, but that's why they have the underwriting process or the selection process. Right. But if you're 65 years old, you just simply can't go buy a 30 year term policy because there's, they're like, hey, you know, there's a, there's more risk there than a 30 year old buying a 30 year sure. term policy. Yeah. So they know how to weigh the odds. Right. Um, and so, you know, if you're buying life insurance at 60 or 65, <laughs> typically your option is to buy permanent life insurance. But the need for it at that point in your life is probably way different than why you would have bought it at 30 or 35. Exactly. So let's talk through that a little bit. And then, you know, then we can kind of get into how they approach you know, even getting this process started. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned the early phase of life a few times. So what's the biggest aspect that people want to take care of at that point, usually? Yeah, so really there's three things typically that come up. And, and I, I always like to talk about needs versus wants, right? And so that's always an interesting conversation. And I, I sort of frame it out in the context of like the house you live in or the car you drive or the clothes you wear. A lot of times, you know, there, there's what we need um, uh, and there's the things that we want, right? And a lot of times we sort of, we, we find balance between those. Well, life insurance is no different, right? We can focus on the need and the right number amount, but a lot of times it's, what do you want your life insurance to do if something really bad happened to you or your spouse? So Eric, like there's really three things I say. Number one is, do we want it to take care of all the debt, Okay. right? So your house, your cars, any other consumer debt, do we want it to take care of all that? The second thing really is education funding. So mm -hmm. myself, I have three kids, two, four, and seven years old. I would love to sit here and tell you that I've got all of the money locked away and stored up for them to go to college. It's just not true, right? So if something were to happen to me, I would want the life insurance proceeds to come in and be able to create a fund that could be there to help educate them. Right. And the last thing, too, and this is where there's a lot of different feelings and opinions, but it's replacing income. Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, if something happened to me, my wife would need additional income coming in. So we got to sit down and think about how much do we need coming in and how long do we want that income to be coming in? So those are the three main things. And from there, we kind of back into what is the right number? Right. What is the right number? But sometimes that's going to go back and forth between what we actually need but we may want more than that yeah. as well, too. So, Sarah, before we started, we were just talking about this this mm -hmm. insurance topic, and you personally, you and your husband, are having this exact conversation yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. Open um, enrollment. Yeah. So, I think it's uh, it's <laughs> interesting. The conversation we had last night um, is how much you need, and the numbering, the number that you need, can be. A whole lot more than than you would think it doesn't go as far as you as you would think it would go right so a million dollars sounds like a lot of money and it is it is a lot of money it's a yeah. lot of money but if you want to do a college education if you want to do income that really only lasts it, it lasts a lot less time than you think it would so, yes it's a great great point so i always say look if, if you were working and you still had a job <laughs> and somebody plopped a million dollars down they're like, man, this is great. That's a lot of money. But if the income goes away and we're paying off debts and we're putting away money for college and things mm -hmm. like that, the money gets consumed a lot quicker than than what you think it would. Well, remember back when we uh, did the the episode about cost of kids, right? The average cost of raising one kid was right. what was it, like two hundred eighty thousand yeah. dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that doesn't include college. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're right. It goes a lot That's faster. Like soccer than... cleats and ballet well, outfits. Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. So you were, but. One thing you were talking about earlier was, you know, what you guys were, were looking at was employer-based insurance, right. so group benefit stuff. Mm -hmm. So that kind of leads me down to the question that we hear sometimes is, I have insurance through my employer, I should be good. So let's talk through that a little bit, because there are some limitations that I don't think people are really aware of when it comes down to the group insurance side of things. Well, for me, depending on what company you work for, um, the group benefit can be a lot. It can be uh, 25000 can be 50000 which is still a lot of money. But again, like we were talking about, it, that can only go so far that really only takes care of like final expenses and things like that. So if there's like a voluntary additional um, group benefit, that's something to look into, especially if, if it's portable and you can take that from job to job um, or if you retire or something like that, um, just to supplement that additional piece, because it's still going to be more cost-effective than if you went on the private market. 
Yeah, I mean, just to tack on there, I mean, I, the first thing I tell is that, that's great, right? I mean, that that's fantastic. If you work for an employer and you have benefits that provides that, it's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. But like you alluded to and like you were saying, there are some pitfalls if you do leave your company and things like that. Like, are you going to be able to take it with you if you had some sort of health event and you did leave your company and you couldn't go get life insurance on your own or in the individual market, then, you know, you probably... It, it could end up steering you in terms of like what's next job wise because you probably want to go find a job where you could get that group insurance and and not have to go through the underwriting process right but a lot of times it's just hey t what we have there is great it's a nice mm -hmm. foundation but we still want to understand is it enough is it the right amount for you so yes it's a good foundation but do we need to come in and add on more maybe not maybe not maybe it's okay but sometimes we do it just all depends so that's really right I think what I'm hearing is there's no one way to just blanketly say, hey, this is how much you need and this is how long you need to keep it. Yeah. Well, we, you know, as, as, as planners, we want to understand what they do have, right? right? So we're going to look and summarize their benefits and get an understanding of that. If we need to come in and say, hey, you know, let's, let's add on top of that or supplement, we will. But, you know, we're, we'd also be the first to tell people, like, you've actually got a really good package through your employer, you know, if we can, if we need to get more, we can always address it, but we're going to keep an eye on it. And, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to have. Yeah. Okay. So how often should people review what they have? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. I'll let you, I'll let you uh, take a stab at that one, Tara. I mean, I think you should review after any big life event. Um, if you have kids, if you get married, if you, you know, um, have Cause change, change jobs, anything like that. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also good to look at it every two years just to make sure that you have what you need, that your income has gone up or your assets have gone up or maybe they've gone down and you need to reassess that way too. So, um, I, so. In, a, in addition to that, yeah, you all, we definitely want to understand that you, you know, do you have the right amount based on like if you have another kid or you're making more money and you, there's more income you want to protect because lifestyle has gone up. Right. Um, but if you own a permanent life insurance policy, there's a performance element to it as well, too, right? So if we're, you know, depending on the goal of the insurance, um, whether we're buying this with a focus on cash value or whatever it is, there's really good reasons to go in on an annual basis and get what they call an enforced ledger run. So, so we understand and we can keep track of how it's performing, Okay. right? So that's another reason to say, hey, does it make sense? Probably time to go ahead and look and see how these things are actually performing. Okay, so one of the most common things that I've heard since being in the business that, that we get to the pleasure of being in on a daily basis is that at some point I'm never going to need life insurance. Right, I get to that, yeah. where, what is it, the self-insured age yeah. kind of, the, and that's a, and that is not, not to say that's not accurate. Right. Because in theory, if you're trying to take care of debt, if you're trying to take care of kids' education expenses, and replace income, your actual insurance needs should decrease daily because you're one day closer to being retired, you're one day closer to not having a mortgage or whatever the debt is. So I get that mindset, but is that actuality, uh, is, that, is, that, is that actually what happens? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting topic, and again, it's 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 a polarizing topic. Oh too, yeah, mm -hmm. right. Um, because yes, when we think about the reasons we buy life insurance, when you're in your mid thirties or mid forties or even your fifties, and you're still building that nest egg, hopefully you're always getting closer to that point where you don't need life insurance for the same reasons you may have bought it when you were right. younger, and you didn't have assets. But when you, when you get older in life, Eric, I mean, things change, right? Like, I'm not there yet, um, but there's going to be a point where I have grandkids. Uh, there's going to be a point where I start thinking about the fact that I am not going to live forever. And you start thinking about, like, do I want to do I want to leave and have an impact or leave a legacy at some capacity? And, and, and that's not what everybody wants to do, right? So it's by no means like a blanket thing. But there are opportunities down the line to say, hey, if we are going to give or we want to leave money to a church, a charity, our family at some mm -hmm. capacity, that there's a lot of features and benefits of life insurance from a tax perspective, from a leverage perspective, that if it's set up the right way, it can be a very impactful tool to leave money to the next generation or the generation after that. So that is not something that people think about when they're buying life insurance at 35 or 40. Right. And we're probably not thinking about that until we're later in life. 
Um, but it does come up. And I spent really the better part of my early career helping people that were 60 and 65 years old try to get life insurance for those purposes. Right. And as you can imagine, it's more expensive then uh, than it is at 30 or 35. Um, but it's just really hard to see those needs at the stage in life that we're all in right now. Well, and cash flow is pretty tight usually mm -hmm. at, in your 30s. Exactly. For most yeah. people, right? Exactly. Especially if you're in that you know scenario where you have a house full of kids running around and you're trying to just survive and advance day to day. Yeah. Um, okay. So how do you process from, all right, the decision has been made. I know that we need life insurance. I think I know how much we need. Now what? That's all you, Sarah. I was going to say, <laughs> so we, we run illustrations. We run them with several companies and um, reputable companies, make sure that we're getting the right price, the right product. Um, and then from there, we have a conversation with the client, make sure that that's really what they're looking for. And then we go through the application and underwriting process. So um, applications are signed, and then um, we will work with the underwriter and be the liaison between the underwriter and the client to, to kind of walk them through um, – the whole underwriting process, getting medicals done, any follow-up questions, um, and then hopefully uh, they'll, you know, be approved as applied, and then um, we can put that in place, and then kind of uh, round out the whole plan and so, make sure that that's all those protections are in place. So talk a little bit about the underwriting process. I know we deal with that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, what does that even mean? Yeah, so there are a lot of um, pieces and parts to the underwriting process. So you have to have, uh, most companies want you to have a medical done um, with labs and a questionnaire uh, for family history, your history, all that kind of thing. And so the underwriter will look at those, um, that information, they'll pull your medical records. Um, they might have questions about what they find in your medical records, um, want to know if you completed follow-ups that were you were referred for or not. Um, and then they might have financial questions. Why do you need this? Or, or you know, what is the purpose of this insurance? Um, and if you have any other coverage in place, um, why do you need this additional coverage? The kind of vetting, can you even qualify for yeah. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I, it really, if we think about the underwriting process, I know the, the refinance market's been huge lately. A lot of people refinancing because mortgage rates are low. So like if you've been through that process, they want to know everything about you financially, right? They're yeah. looking at bank statements. Yeah. They're looking at credit card statements, uh -huh. you know, every part of your financial life. So really underwriting for this is kind of similar, but we add in the medical side of it too. Right. Because as I mentioned earlier, these companies are smart. So they're like, hey, I want to know how healthy you are. I want to know how healthy you are. And they're going to give you a price based on what you qualify for, right? So our job is to really kind of coach people through mm -hmm. that process uh, and help set the expectation for what that entails because up front, all we can do is kind of quote it based on what we think. But until they start looking at medical records, until they do blood pressure and, and the labs, as Sarah mentioned, like we don't really know exactly how much it's going to cost. Kind of the best guess. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, okay. So that leads me into the, the thought of, let's say someone owns a life insurance policy and they get five years into it and they say, you know what? I don't really need this anymore. Now what do they do? Is there any um, blowback? If they decide to walk away from it, to change, how does that work? So I was going to say with term insurance, you're not going to, there's no cash value. So, you know, there's really no problem with doing that there other than losing the benefit. Um, with permanent life insurance, um, there is a cash value aspect to it. And so the longer you stay in that, the more that grows. And so you would really lose out on that um, asset if you kind of got out of it in those early years because it hasn't had time to really get going and, okay. and grow. Yeah. But they can just walk away and no issues, right? Yeah. They could walk away, yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like renting uh, versus owning a house, right? So like you can rent when, when your lease is up, you, you're out of there, you don't really get anything out of it, right? So you, and you could, you know, theoretically break your lease. So this is not a perfect example because like if I wanted to walk away from my term insurance policy five years in, I just, I just stop paying premiums. I'm not bound by that company right. to continue paying premiums, right? It's kind of a one-way contract. Okay. The permanent insurance, right? If I wanted to walk away in five or 10 years, ideally, hopefully there's going to be some cash value or equity built up as Sarah was mentioning. So if you walk away, you may be able to recover some of what you put into it. Now, the longer you're in the contract, Theoretically, there should be more there if you wanted to 
uh, uh, get out of the contract or quit at some point in the future. Okay. All right. So I think that's that's a good summary of the if you die. Yeah. <laughs> what happens if you don't die? Yeah. So long-term disability is another topic that comes up a lot in our office. Tell me, just broad scopes, what are we trying to do with that? Yeah. So, you know, disability insurance, again, I, it, it's right there with life insurance in terms of um, – top subjects people really don't want to talk about. Right? They probably already turned us off. <laughs> yeah, they probably, probably so. <laughs> yeah, so That's if okay. you're still listening, uh, you know who you are. Um, so disability insurance, you know, you talk about insuring your assets, right? So for most people our age, their house is, we think is our biggest asset, right? So we have homeowner's insurance. But if we really think about it, like probably our biggest asset is what we're able to make over the next 10, 20, 30 years. So for me, if my plan is to work till 65, I got 27, 28 more years to work and make money. That's a big asset. Mm -hmm. So if something happens to me and I can't work and I can't make a living, I probably want to make sure that that asset is insured at some capacity. Okay. Right. So at its core, that's what we're trying to do with disability is protect your future income earning potential. Okay. So Sarah, when, when we start going through this with a client and talking through what options they have, kind of coming back full circle with the group benefit piece. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you will have an employer that offers some sort of a benefit if you're a, you know, a sizable company, even some of the smaller companies. Yeah. How do you mesh those two? Um, so a lot of companies will do, uh, I think the average is usually about 60% of your income is what they'll <clears> cover. <throat> some have a cap on how much that, uh, that can be. Um, and then after that, you can supplement with individual coverage. So you'll look at your income and you can run a quote based on if you have any other coverage, whether it's individual or group. Um, and with the individual piece, the benefit that you will receive will be non-taxable because the, the premium going in will have already, the, those dollars will have already been taxed um, versus group insurance is usually taxed when the, the benefit is received because that's coming out pre-tax. So it's just a, um, blending of, of the pre and post tax benefit. Okay. So, I mean, kind of putting a bow on that bottom line is like, if you're making money and something happens to you, Eric, like we want you to be able to continue your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's something that the resembles what it is today. And if you're able to save money on top of that, like we wanted you to be able to continue to save money. Right. So that the plan that the plan that we're putting together doesn't unravel because we can't work at the capacity that we used to. I mean, honestly, that's to me, that that would be the worst case scenario, even more so than dying prematurely. Yeah. And it's man, neither one of those are fun to think about. But like, yeah, I mean, if you're not able to work and presumably you've got some pretty serious <clears throat> health conditions. So now not only are you not able to bring in money, somebody's having to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas, you know, unfortunately, I mean, if you die, there's going to be a death benefit. Just like car insurance. Like I, I view those two as being very similar, except the state makes you have car insurance. Yeah. Or you can't drive down the road. Well, you could, but you'd probably get arrested. <laughs> um, that's another topic. So <laughs> right. with disability insurance, though, you know, if let's say the, the common question is going to be, I'm never going to be disabled. I'm always going to be able to do what I do. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Eric, and it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, you pay for your car insurance and you pay for your home insurance. Nobody comes home from work and says, I hope my house is burned out, <laughs> right? Or, or, or like nobody says, well, I hope I get in a car wreck because I'm going to get what I paid for. Like, it's just not the way that it works, mm -hmm. right? So we buy disability <laughs> insurance. No, like, you know, we don't want you to become disabled. Right. And, and the odds are you may never become disabled. But that's that at its core, that's what insurance is in whatever capacity it's insuring. Yeah. So, you know, think about it. What what could cause somebody to be disabled is a pretty broad topic. Yeah. I think you could speak to this because you've seen a lot more working with the insurance carriers mm -hmm. directly with some of uh, the folks that we've been able to help. What's actually the experience that you have seen going through that with different carriers? I think there is a it's a broader topic than a lot of people realize. And with <clears throat> disability, it's also not a one-time use thing. So you can... If you have a disability policy and you satisfy the elimination period and you go on claim for a couple months, a couple of years, and then you go back to work, your right. disability policy is still there. Yeah. So you can go on claim multiple times. Um, it's not just a one-time use. So it's also not exclusively you got to get you know mangled in a car accident. Right. And can't can't walk and can't do anything. It, yeah. It's it's really more to it than that. It is. It's yeah. A, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
Okay. Yeah, there, there's a lot of different definitions of disability and uh, own occupation versus any occupation. Oh, you're getting down the rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, now. You, can, you can really <laughs> oh, go. You can really go to down hey, the weeds. The, the three it, people but, that we had listen yeah. to this truly just turned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Come, come, back. come back. Come back. Okay. All right. Let's switch to the last piece. So this is probably one of the most complicated topics: is long-term care insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, probably one of the most crucial, even more so than the other two. I, I would. I would. I would think. So. Where we are right now, the odds, according to the Wall Street Journal, is seven out of 10 people, if you are turning 65 today, are going to need some level of care before they die. Yeah. All right, so it's a very likely scenario that happens. Yeah. yeah. So let's just talk through in you know 30,000 foot view of what, what we see, how has the market changed, what's out there now, is it really as expensive as people think it is? When should they talk about it? I mean, I can go on and on and on. Yeah, this is um, I, personally something I'm super passionate about, right? Just through family experiences, and you know, I, it's you know, I don't bring it up at dinner parties as a topic of conversation. I'm not like that geeked out about it, but <laughs> it's a big deal, right? I mean, we we have an aging population. You know, we probably all heard like 10,000 Americans turning 65 every day. That's going to continue to happen. Mm-hmm. Families are smaller. Um, more so spread out. More spread out, yeah. And so, like, the, the idea of becoming older, and at some point, if you take a, a husband and a wife, there's a super high likelihood, greater than 70% chance, that one of them is going to need long-term care, right? So what is long-term care? It's where you you need the you need assistance with two of the six activities of daily living, like eating, bathing, transferring continents, all of those things, right? So we hear, you know, really bad stories about being in nursing homes and things like that. At its core, because I could talk for another 30 minutes on this, but at its core, we're trying to look at like those obstacles up ahead that's, that's, that basically would put us in a position where we're having to spend a lot more money mm-hmm. out of the portfolio to cover these increased costs. So where we can, can we find a way to hedge against the high likelihood that we're going to have to spend more money on health care costs when we get to retirement than we ever thought we possibly could, right? So how much is long-term care going to cost me? It's it, it's hard. It's really difficult to pinpoint that because again, it's it's depending on your age, it's depending on your health, <clears throat> it's depending on the type of of long term care insurance you want to use, right? So it used to be you had to buy what they called a standalone long term care. It only paid if you got sick. There's a lot of different options in the market today that are going to pay out in some form or fashion, whether it's through a death benefit, whether it's through cash value, or whether it's through a long term care benefit. Again, another super deep topic by itself. Yep. But it just depends on like what makes sense, what can we afford, can we reposition assets from one pocket, right? So can we reposition assets out of the portfolio and move them over here into a product that can hedge against that? Like we don't really don't know until we do the planning and understand the cash flow, and then we kind of back into what's the, going to be the right fit or the right solution. Got it. So Sarah, is long-term care insurance, the, is the process of going into that um, I don't know, that coverage, is it the same as life insurance? Is it the same as disability insurance? What? It's very similar. Um, some carriers do require uh, a medical, but a lot of them, it's just a really extensive phone interview. Um, a lot of them will do um, cognitive tests over over the phone mm-hmm. rather than just, you know, your medical history and that kind of thing. Um, so I think... It is very similar. It's just a little bit more of an interview. So they're looking for different things, I would assume. They they are looking for different things. They're looking um, to see if you can uh, continue the premiums through uh, past retirement. They are uh, wanting to know where you are currently medically. Do you already have? Can you continue? Can you already yeah. do <clears throat> all six? Uh, activities of daily living, or are you already missing one or two of those? Um, so they just kind of want to know where you're heading. Um, are you going to need specialized care? Are you going to just need, you know, a little help here and there? Are you going to need um, mental, yeah. like Alzheimer's, that kind of thing? What's your family history kind of thing? You, you asked a good question in the beginning of this is when do we see people <clears throat> thinking about it or doing it? Mm-hmm. And I think that's, I think that's really key because what I see, um, is the time that people start thinking about it is when they're 60 or 65 and they've had to take care of an aging parent at some Mm -hmm. capacity, right? The challenge with that is 
you're 65, you may be bumped and bruised a little bit and have some issues where it's harder to get that. Right. So we really try to start encouraging our clients to think about it in, in their mid to late 40s, early 50s even. And then usually people are like, do I really need to start thinking about this then? So exciting. And it's right? so exciting. It, you know, and it is, and it's, but it's for the reasons I just said, because by the time this becomes a big deal and we start thinking about it, it's going to be, it's going to be naturally harder to get. Yeah. Or, you know, people like we're in our 30s and we've watched our, um, you know, we have grandparents that we've seen it and we've seen the impact on our our own parents. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's something you don't want that to be the burden that you carry on for your kids. Like, you know, some parents have to take care of or our parents have to take care of their parents and some people have to retire to, in order to take care of, of their own parents. And so you want to kind of make sure that that's not something that has to happen in your life too. Yeah. I, so what comes to mind is the, one of the earlier episodes we did um, had uh, Courtney Bowman, mm-hmm. who um, owns a assisted care yeah. business here in Greenville. She mentioned a sandwich generation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and kind of how we fall into that, where what that means is that you've got parents who you could be helping to take care of at some point, but also that you may have children in your house that you're taking care of. So you kind of got it on both ends. Mm -hmm. And the sandwich generation, which I I would fall into that, um, you would fall into that, you would fall into that, is what's the impact on their financial status as they're trying to take care of a parent and a kid at the same time. And then you, you mentioned you don't really think about it until something's happened. That's kind of what I see is probably the biggest factor that goes into this. Well, why somebody would look at it a little earlier is because they've, they've gone through that. Yeah. I I think, I think it like we live through and we react to the experiences that we live. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and, and so, a lot of times when people call about life insurance is because they've had somebody that they're close to <clears throat> passed away way before they ever thought they were sure. going to, right? And right. it just, and that's the thing. It, it's, you know, it's the same thing with long-term care. Um, so, so for myself, my brothers and I, we had a we had a mom that had a chronic conditions. Our grandmother was in a nursing home facility for six years. Um, I, we we saw what that was like. We saw the expense. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. right. And so yeah, em- emotionally, it's a horrible thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's a horrible thing. Even if you can get the best care, it's a horrible thing. But if you don't have the ability to pay for the best care, and that's an issue, or you don't have the money, then you've got, you know, it, it, it's just it's a situation that really nobody wants to go through. And and a lot of times we can't you know, just depending on the resources that we have, we can't remove it completely from being an issue. Our job is to say, can we at some capacity uh, relieve or try to eliminate the potential burden that this could be emotionally, maybe not emotionally, but hopefully financially at some, right. at some regard. Okay. So if you want to know more about that topic, I would, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the two part series that we did earlier in the year. Um, it's probably like the fourth or fifth episode somewhere in there. Um, we talk a lot more about the long-term care industry in, yeah. in a whole. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, let's cut it here. Um, we might have a couple people still listening from the insurance yeah. world, but you know, hopefully what, what you took away from this is that insurance is a topic that a lot of people avoid um, because it's not a fun topic to talk about. And really it's, it's a very misunderstood topic and you can go out and research a bunch of different information. It's just depending upon what your scenario is, it may be relevant. It may not be. So from a planning discussion, planning topic takeaway, I would say, Find someone that you trust who is in the business of helping you understand what insurance might, how it might play out in your, in your scenario and just Mm -hmm. have a discussion with them. Um, Really no harm, no foul there. Do you guys have anything else that you would advise for folks as they try and make a decision on what they do there? No, it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy topic. It is a heavy topic. Uh, It's not fun to talk about. um, But at the end of the day, it's, it's a, it's super important, um, and facing it at, at some level is uh, tough, but could be the could be the right thing to do. I mean, think about it, we avoided it all year long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it was didn't make it on the top ten. Right. right. <laughs> right. Um, all right. So last uh, last piece. So Sarah, this is the first time you've joined us, so yes. you get uh, subjected to the questions. Oh, good. Um, financial mistake you learned the hard way. Oh. Um, well, I don't know if it's necessarily a financial mistake, but I learned that, uh, 
you really need to rotate your tires because that will be a financial mistake if you <laughs> okay. don't. That's good advice. Uh, learn that the, the really hard way. Okay. All right. Um, last two things you've spent money on. Oh, dog food and uh, gas. All right. Very yeah. practical. Yeah, very okay. Good. All right. So that's we're going to stop it there. Um, guys, thanks for joining me today. <laughs> Hopefully this has been uh, helpful for you if you've been listening all the way through. Um, if you've got questions or you want to suggest topics that you'd like for us to cover, you can reach us uh, directly through our website at fostervictorwa.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at Foster Victor Wealth Advisors. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Information contained in this podcast was intended for general use, not to be used as specific advice. For content tailored to your personal situation, please contact one of our wealth coaches.